Okay, thank you all for being here today, this evening, this lovely evening. Uh, my name is Narinjan Kalsa. I am the acting director of the Yoga Studies program this year while Professor Christopher Chapel is on sabbatical. It's so wonderful to see all your lovely faces, to have you here tonight. If you haven't gotten a chance to get some food, there is still some food available over there. Tonight, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Shanti Shantikar. Kalsa. Uh, we do have the same last name. We're part of the same Kundalini Yoga Sikh community, and all of us were given the same last name by our spiritual teacher, Yogi Bhajan. So I've gotten a few of those questions tonight already, so I thought I would let everybody know we're not related, but we do come from the same community, and we even have houses next to each other in, um, in New Mexico. Dr. Shanti Shanti Karkalsa, PhD, brings the ancient teachings of Kundalini Yoga into modern medicine. She has taught kundalini yoga since 1971 and began to teach people with chronic or life-threatening illness in 1986 under the guidance of Yogi Bhajan. Dr. Khalsa directs the Guru Ram Das Center for Medicine and Humanology founded to bring kundalini yoga and the teachings of Yogi Bhajan into healthcare. She is a medical family therapist Yoga Alliance 500 hours certified and a KRI certified Kundalini Yoga mentoring lead trainer for levels one and two. Dr. Khalsa is a charter founder member of the International Association of Yoga Therapists and served on the team that developed IAYT educational standards for yoga therapy teacher training. And she worked with Dr. Larry Payne as well um, to do these things, who is here today. Thank you for being here. She directs the three-year, 1,000-hour International Kundalini Yoga Therapy Professional Training and provides continuing education for health professionals and yoga teachers. Her Kundalini Yoga program for people living with HIV is featured in the book Yoga as Medicine by Timothy McCall, and her groundbreaking work as a Kundalini Yoga Therapist is featured in the book Yoga Therapy and Integrative Medicine, where ancient science meets modern medicine, also by Dr. Larry King. Yes. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for being here, and I'm going to let you take it over. Yeah. So we're going to allow yourself to relax a little. We're going to have some fun tonight. We'll be talking a bit about, um, we'll be weaving. My basis, my main focus is yoga therapy. But it, as a yoga therapist, we also know you include the depth and the breadth of the history and the philosophy of yoga practice. So I've took a, a little sliver, one little thread line that we'll be covering tonight with some information, a few stories, and we'll be closing with a meditation. What are the, um, the benefits of having Larry as a friend? Years ago, I was working on my dissertation, and he was working, I think you were working on your first book? Yeah. And then we had our friend Sherry Browman was working on Walk Yourself Well. And so we came together every week and supported each other to move forward, move forward, move forward. So I'm mentioning that because the meditation we're going to do was the one that I used in the study. So you'll, I'll get to tell you a little bit about that meditation, its effects and benefits, and what our research showed. But mostly, we're going to relax and enjoy our time together. So I'd like to have a, an idea how many people here are also either practicing as yoga therapists or who would like to study and become a yoga therapist. So quite a few. So I'll be, I'll, I can weave in our yoga therapy approaches in here. How many are here primarily because your, well, your class time requires you to sit here, right? Uh, besides that, uh, most of your work is, or your interest is in yoga philosophy. Okay. Other reasons why you're here. <coughs> okay, that covers the range. Just ancient versus modern. That really ancient good. versus modern. Not versus, I should say. Uh, instead. Meets, meets how the ancient wisdom and modern science. That really appeals to me. Okay, we'll do a little meeting as well. <laughs> So we're going to start with uh, 
color rhetorical question. What is the purpose of yoga practice? Why do we do this stuff? You hold a certain position of your body, you breathe in ways that other people don't breathe, you're using these sounds that you don't necessarily, other people don't know what they mean. Why do we do this? What's the purpose of it? Attunement. Attunement. Attunement to? Uh, attuning the instrument of the body with the spirit and working the frequencies throughout um, so to attune to your physical body, mm -hmm. it does, practice of yoga absolutely does that. What else happens when we practice yoga? Or what is our intention when we practice yoga? What are we seeking to experience in the practice of yoga? Infinity. The infinite. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in many ways of understanding, that's us. Right? It's our true identity. It's our authentic, original self. Okay. So we awaken with already what's in us to become, to bring our awareness to what's going on in our physical body. And in the Kulini Yoga model, we, ha we think of ten bodies. There's the, the five kosha model, which is similar and different. But in Kulini Yoga, we have a, a model that we use 10 bodies. And we're going to be working or speaking around um, the prana, the pranamaya, or the pranic body as well as in, our, in our thread through tonight. The practice of yoga also awakens to us our hidden talents, our hidden gifts, what we come into the planet with that maybe we're not aware of until we start to do the kinds of practices that ex ex awaken it, cultivate it, develop it, and bring us into an awareness of who we really are. To connect with our essence, our source, as our true identity. There's um, a phrase in Kalini Yoga that we use a lot, which is, you may have heard this already, Satnam. Who, for whom that's the first time you've ever heard Satnam? Okay, <coughs> Sat Nam, let me say a few words about it. Sat is truth, Nam is your name and your identity. We use Sat Nam <coughs> primarily to connect with a, a practice of the breath. When we inhale Sat, we exhale Nam. So the mantra is silent, the sound current is silent, but the breath comes in with that sound, the breath goes out with that sound. As a way to have us remember as a way to have us feel on a sensory level, on a physiological level, our true identity. Not just the physical body, but our identity as a soul. We all, you'll, you'll hear this phrase, um, we say it as a greeting, we say it as a goodbye, we can say, oh my gosh, Satnam, how could that possibly have happened, right? <laughs> we use it a lot in phrases, but it's the idea is, going back to attunement, sound attunes us. And so that particular sound attunes us to our authentic self. You may have heard, who is here has practiced Kulini Yoga as taught by Yogi Bhajan? So you've had some experiences. Okay. There's, uh, sometimes people have the idea that Kundalini energy is this, just, like this goes through your body and you like get smacked upside the head. Maybe you thought that. But what makes Kulini Yoga, uh, the way that it's taught by, in the West now, by Yogi Bhajan, not do that, is through sound current. When you include sound with the practice, when you bring your meditative mind to an attunement, to a frequency, your raising of your energy, of your vitality, of your, um, that which awakens you, is integrated. It's rhythmic. It's in a pulse. The awareness comes in ways that you can manage it. It's not like, boom. So when we, just even something simple, like when you inhale, you think the sound of sat, and when you exhale, you think the sound of nam, you're creating an integration of that awakened frequency. So it's like, oh my God, I'm God, really? I'm really God? It doesn't really happen that way. 
it's more of, wow, I live in this body. So you know, C.S. Lewis was very fond of saying, you are a soul, we have a body. And so in our, in our thinking, in common language, we say, I have a soul. And this is the idea that we are a, a body, but it's the other way around. And when you use sound current, whatever tradition you're trained in, that sound current is designed to give you an integration as well as an awareness and an attunement of realms that are not ones necessarily we could see with our physical eyes. So the, our purpose of practicing yoga is also to express the joy of that and to manifest or deliver what our purpose in life is, why we came on the planet, why we took an incarnation. And that gives us a support and a sense of values in terms of how we live our life. Is that true? Is that so? Okay. I thought so. You learn that in your yoga philosophy training. The idea of this is so that we, we understand the human body from a yogic perspective as having the capability of giving us these experiences. It's possible, it's within us, the nervous system, the way the endocrine system is. And the practices of yoga invoke what's already there. It invoke the natural capacity of the human body. And when we think of, uh, you know, the natural capacity really is to give us an experience of who we really are. And when we th use uh, yoga therapeutically, when we help people with health conditions or we help people with structural conditions to get well, it really is simply a bringing back or bringing together of what's been dysregulated so that the experience of our vitality, our health, can be restored. Once you have your vitality back, your body can do just about anything. You know, whatever the challenge, the health challenge is. You're just awakening your inner resources to come to bear on that. Now we get down to why we're here tonight. Okay, how do we do this? We do it through the generation and focus of prana. From a yogic tradition perspective, prana is, well, it's the life force, obviously, but it's, it's, it connects all of your koshas. It connects, it's the divining thread to all of them. And in, in Kulini Loka language, you would say it's a divining thread through all the bodies. Our mental bodies are stable because of the vitality that comes from the prana. When your energy is low, just think about it. How, what's the quality of your thought? It's a quality of your mood. It's very much affected to the vitality that comes from the prana. The prana will also affect your endocrine system, your nervous system, your physical body in very specific ways. So as we work through this, we're calling our tonight's presentation the vitality principle. Because really what we're saying, that the base of yoga practice and the outcomes that come from yoga practice is founded in prana accessing it, growing it, building it, cultivating it, and then focusing its direction. So as the prana is directed, so goes how we feel, so goes how we function, so goes the sensation or the attunement that you described about the, the, subtle, the subtle sensations that are not yet measurable. What are the things about yoga practice? It seems kind of ephemeral, doesn't it? You know, you breathe a certain way, you block off this, and maybe you put your hand this way and what have you. And then you do this for a certain period of time and then something happens. You feel different, but you don't necessarily know how you got there. Have you ever had that experience? <laughs> Feels good, can't explain it with beans. I just know that it does. And sometimes when, I, you, know, when you work with people therapeutically, I'll just say something really simple like, this will help you sleep or this will help you feel better, or this will help uh, relieve your pain. Something re just like very simple, short. And those are the ways that, you know, from ancient times, yogic practices were just described. And in, in some traditions, the practitioner or the yoga therapist, which we call now, 
I didn't tell the person anything about anything. Just eat this, read this way, walk this way, and notice what happens. But the idea that the um, too much information, the mind would go race, what about this, what about that, how come? So we give less information and more experience. Because it's experience that helps us to really trust the practice. Except if you're working in a medical field. Right? You need data. Right? You need information. You need research. I'm mentioning this part because the ephemeral things of yoga, there's um, about 30 years ago, it was when really the yoga research world started to shift. The research on yoga that was done in the West in the 60s and 70s was pitiful. And there are a number of researchers who began to focus their attention on shifting the quality of yoga research. So that there's some idea of uh, mechanics, meaning how this stuff works. And there's now information on outcomes, meaning what happens when you do it. Even if I don't know how it works, I know that it can get me here or there. So what our, from our focus, we're talking about um, language and concepts that are not really yet measurable. I believe that the yoga therapy research world will really begin to boom when we have more technology that allows these things to be measured. You know, with, with now that we had functional MRIs, it completely shifted the quality of yoga research, yoga therapy research. And as the technology emerges, evolves, gets more subtle in its own way, then there'll be more information on how the stuff works, the basic mechanisms. There's recently I saw a research study that was talking about the nervous system, and the person who wrote it up was clearly a yogi. He called the nervous system pranic pathways. <laughs> And I thought, this got published? <laughs> Might be late at the top. But this is, this is from a foundational um, perspective. You can't measure, you can't measure product, but you can't even really describe what it is, can you? Have you ever had a hard time explaining to somebody what prana is? Well, it's energy. What else do you say? your vital force. What gives you the understanding of what prana is, is your experience. <coughs> it's your practice and you have the experience of it. And then maybe you'll find more words that kind of match it. But our attention is on the, uh, uh, today is going to be on a bit on your prana. <coughs> so when we work with people who have physical health conditions, working to get well, or just our own self when you just work for a lot. I mean, who doesn't work a lot anymore, right? <laughs> world has changed. You're doing five things at the same time, and everybody is more busy than they want to be. <coughs> so you, what we end up doing is running our life on our adrenaline. We run it on our sympathetic nervous system. And that definitely leads to burnout and to exhaustion. What if we switch that and instead run on prana? What if we, instead of pushing through something, we raise our prana? Instead of making something, you know, like stretching yourself beyond whatever, because you have this one more thing that needs to be done, we create a rhythmic pulse to that. The concepts that are in the natural practice of yoga can be applied really basically to raising your vitality. When we talk about the vitality principle, really what we're saying is everything's based on your vitality. Your mood, your mental health, your uh, physical health, your about what you can accomplish, the quality of your relationships. Name something that isn't affected by prana. Can you name something? Everything is affected by it. So when we work therapeutically, it's the first thing we look for. What is the quality of the prana in that person? And the yoga therapist, you know all the things, you know about values and this and that. But it's a really foundational thing to be able to assess the quality of your prana, to know where it's weak, where it's imbalanced, 
and to use yogic methods to change that. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at the very first part of this vitality principle is you raise vitality first. Have you ever had, well, even in our own lives, not even necessarily a client or a student, something you needed to do, a habit you needed to change, or a behavior you wanted to bring into your life? Anybody ever have that? Yeah, okay. And you have a great idea. I'm going to whatever that is. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to walk every day. I'm going to stop eating sugar. You know, like all these great things, right? We really want to do that. We really have an intention to do that. We even started to do that. And then what happens? It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe just tomorrow I could do that walk or whatever. When we go there, what that indicates is our vitality is not strong enough to match the intention. The energy isn't strong enough to, to help you to cross that path, to deliver what you want to deliver. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. So this is why, even before you introduce whatever it is that you're going to be doing, or to your client, to yourself, to your student, you raise a vitality first. Because when you've got the proper prana, is there anything you can't do? Or hold to, or be consistent with, or resist the, it tastes so good, temptation in there? All of those, those tendencies to move away from your intention come when our prana is low. So if we can pay attention to that and notice that, oh, I'm going to do something to raise my vitality instead. And it doesn't have to be something long. It can be something really short, really sweet. But the idea is before you head out to do whatever it is you want to do, you make sure you have enough gas in the car. So, I mean, that's kind of simple. Okay, so you, you enroll in a master's program. Everyone here has done that or doing that. When you, that's a big change in your life, isn't it? You have to plan your time, your finances, your family life. It's all, you're going for a master's degree, that takes time. You prepare for it, and then you can practice and go through and deliver it. If you don't, what happens? You get overwhelmed. Something, something else in your life starts to fall apart. Maybe it's usually you, your own health. Or maybe some pressure comes and it's, the whole thing falls apart and you need to like drop out or whatever. So our idea is raise your vitality first. Build your prana first before you embark on any kind of change. Because without change, doing something different, you're going to keep having the same thing. So you need to make a change somewhere. Raise your vitality before you do that. Make sense? Okay. So the but prana, when you build your prana, you increase your vitality, you increase your capacity for stillness. Because the prana then is contained by your other support behaviors you have. You know the Ayurveda people know what you need to do about that. But you create the idea that as prana is increases, you need to support the prana through your lifestyle habits. It's like you oh, Who's here is also a yoga teacher? Have you ever had anybody come to your class, and at the end of the class, they come right, right up to you and go, oh my God, that was the best class I ever had in my life. You changed my life. You're so wonderful. I'm doing this every day. And then you never see them again? <laughs> you have people like that? What happened? Their vitality, their prana body, their prana activity increased, but they didn't have a way to contain or sustain it or support it. And they don't come back. All right, so when you practice yoga in a way that is traditional, meaning uh, there are components to the yoga practice that support the outcome, you increase your calmness and your capacity for stillness because your nervous system's attuned. You're Endocrine system's balanced. You're running on your prana instead of your sympathetic nervous system. And your capacity for stillness increases as your prana is uh, increased and stabilized. All right, now we get into the more of how we do that. 
you know japa, repetition. So rep it isn't just like you do the same thing over and over and over again. It's specific to rhythmic targeted movement, either through the movement through the breath, the movement through the sound current, or in Kundalini Yoga, a lot of our practices are physical movements. There's a rhythmic targeted component to it that uh, takes the skill of a teacher or a yoga therapist to actually invoke in the student. But when you create, when you experience your body as a frequency generator, when you take the prana that you have, that you've awoke, that you have cultivated, that you're now focusing and directing it intentionally, when you do this, and you do it in a repetitive, um, balanced, systematic, rhythmic manner, it stays with you. It's like you put, you're putting money in the bank, and it's getting compound interest. And you come, when you need to draw on it, you have more than you thought you had. And so we talk a lot about stress and the ill effects of stress and the health effects of stress. Really, all stress is, if you, to, from a simplified way of thinking, is unrhythmic living. Unrhythm in your life, unrhythm in your breathing, in your movements, in your diet. It's out of rhythm. And that becomes a dysregulated state of being. And then the body has the effects of that. So when we talk about experiencing your body as a frequency generator, we're talking about rhythmic movement and rhythmic sound. You can create that through mudra, through posture, through breath, through mantra, whatever combinations that your own system of yoga gives you. This is a key thread that moves through in terms of our vitality principle. Before we move to the next step, what questions do you have about what we've covered so far? Comments, observations you want to make? Yes? What strategies are there then to contain the prana, as you mentioned before, where it's, it's something that they can be sustained further? It's almost entirely lifestyle habits. Hmm. Um, diet, herbs, things to eat and not eat, you know, to eliminate. Simple, simple things. We, Yogi Bhajan would call this rhythmic strength. And it's a, beside, after you raise people's energy, you work to address their rhythm, the rhythm in their life. It's something really basic sometimes as waking up and going to bed at the same time every day, eating your meals at the same time every day. And who on this planet does that anymore? You know, we know how stretched we can be and how um, externally the commands and demands of life can be. But when we make a decision to, to even just one thing, not like the whole life, but just do one thing, you'll notice a big difference in how your prana is maintained. Just something, so start with something simple and, and, and easy in reach that you can do. Okay. Can I have a question? Yes. In, in, in your tradition, when you're assessing prana, is there, uh, what types of things are you looking for for evaluating where prana is moving or not moving? We have a course on that. <laughs> <laughs> so simple is your observation. I mean, I mean in the next three sentences, um, your observation of the structural, you know, the things you know basic about breath. Um, sometimes you'll notice it in the language that people use, how they speak about their experiences. Sometimes though, you'll notice it in what they describe as their symptoms. That you can tell, oh, the values, the, the, the qualities of the prana are off this way or that. So that's the simple way. I'm sure you have a way as well. Yes, that's yeah. true. So it sounds like it's um, multi-faceted. In yes. And then you can do a test run. You know, you can um, assess the prana through posture. Is another way to assess it. How people are breathing in different postures. Okay. Yes. Just I just wanted to share because it was so profound to me at a conference I was at, and we were talking about prana. Um, they used a simple rose. You know, it was like a five-day conference, and so they 
had a single cut rose in a glass in the front of the space that we would stare at every day. And they just used that vision to help us see what prana can look like be felt like as it's not doing all the things that we can do internally and externally to manage our problem. So you had an above and an image which helped you evoke the experience. Yeah. It's very lovely. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. It's good to have live things around us. <laughs> the one other component is sangat or community being around people who have shared values, have shared intentions, who can be supportive in the kinds of changes you want to make or in the way that you want to, to live. Having community is a huge part of cultivating and directing your product, your life force. I have this um, a couple I was working with. Mostly the wife had some, she has uh, recovering from a certain level of anxiety in her life that was interfering in her life. And she, she started doing the simple thing, like going to bed at the same time, getting up at the same time to establish some kind of rhythmic strength. The third session, she said, you know, this is really ruining my life. Yeah. All my friends, she's like, I think she's 28, all my friends go out, I can't go anywhere. They, uh, nobody wants to go to you know, end something at 8 o'clock. They all want to start something at 8 o'clock. How long am I going to have to do this? Yeah, that was like her, her main focus. Now it's 18 months into working with her, and she's like, oh, they could stay out all they want. I feel so good when I don't do that. So the sensation she has was more uh, motivating than whatever sensation she had when she had nighttime fun with her friends. So one of the ways you could look at these kinds of changes as you establish, you don't need everyone in your life to support what you're doing, but you need a few people. So one of the ways that you can look at this, and this is how she ended up with it. I want to have fun at night with my friends, and I want to feel good. Which do I want more? And she was able to make that decision. Ah, I want to feel, I want that more than the going out thing. So she saw her friends during the day, like for lunch dates or for walking, uh, adventures at, uh, after work. So she found other ways to be her, to have that socialness and at the same time also honor what she, what she needs. All right, so our vitality principle. Prana is the basis of our experience and yoga is, the practice of yoga helps to generate and guide or direct the prana. That's our really simple principle. So there was um, I'll tell you a little story. I, as Narinjan mentioned, I started as a Kulini yoga teacher and I was teaching for 15 years and I found myself in Los Angeles in the early 80s when this was the beginning of the explosion of the AIDS epidemic. In 1984, there was the first year that um, there was a test to find out if a person was HIV positive or not. And there were quite a few, quite a, in Southern California, we had something like 60,000 people by some count that were, found themselves to be infected with the virus, came on really sudden from otherwise young, healthy people. And I was like a little overwhelmed by all of this because some of these folks decided to come to yoga class because they're looking for things to help them. There was no really medical treatment at that time, and they were looking for ways, maybe this could help me, maybe that could help me. So they were trying all kinds of things, and they came to the yoga class. I had never been around people who were that ill. I just, it was a completely new experience for me, and I absolutely didn't know how to teach yoga to people who, who couldn't, their lymphatic system was so congested, it was painful to lift the arms even this high, because the swelling, and, and they were, uh, you do some some breathing and they would get sick to their stomach and nauseous and headaches. So I it was like I was out of my league basically. And Yogi Bhajan said I told, him, I told him what was going on. He said, "Okay, you know that at least in the Kulini Yoga, it's not inherently a therapeutic system, which is why you can't just apply what you know to people with health conditions. 
if you actually need a, a different set of skills to work with this. And that yoga practice, specifically Kulini yoga practice, was originally formed for healthy people to experience their excellence. It wasn't developed for ill people to get well. Okay, so now what? <laughs> you know, I've got groups of people coming who are like really sick, and they feel better, they were able to relax or what have you, then they bring their friends, and so there they were. So over a period of nine years, from uh, 1986 to 1995, he unfolded, you know, it, it emerged a system of teaching Kundalini yoga therapeutically, which is now what we teach in our uh, yoga therapies training. And it, it took um, a bit of practice and format and development and emerging. And at that time, I also started working with a man named Carl Simonton, who brought the ancient practice of guided imagery into cancer. You may not have heard his name, but you know what he did. You remember anyone says to you, oh, imagine your immune cells like little Pac-Man eating up the, the you, you've, you've heard of using image? It's an ancient system, and it's an also an ancient system within uh, the practice of yoga. But he brought that into the Western medicine. And then this is the 1970s, so you can just imagine how that was received. <laughs> he was a radiation oncologist doing this. So he stopped doing whatever the regular medical um, thing is, and he formed these uh, programs for people with cancer. It was a residential program in Temescal Canyon one week a month, and I worked with him there for a while. So we bringing this yoga into all these different settings uh, allowed the... Um, the technology of how to teach therapeutically to emerge and to fold and to, uh, to see how this actually can really be applied. And at that point, that's when Yogi Bhajan said, okay, good, well done, ha not half-baked, well cooked. Now we can take from your office, from your private practice of yoga therapy and bring it into the world, which is when we, I moved to New Mexico, we started the nonprofit. So when we talk about this, what we're talking about is its formula. So the people who raised your hands earlier as that you do yoga therapy work, have you ever had a situation where you really didn't know what to do? Anybody had that experience? Of course. <laughs> okay, so and I had like a whole lot of those. Uh, so he said, okay, if your first principle is to raise the vitality, to help the person, then the, when the vitality is raised, when the prana is raised, the body can make its own self-correction. So how do you do that? So he gave this formula. You access, he was fond of formulas. I put the little plus sign. You access, then you strengthen, and then you integrate. And what this creates is vitality and calm, or energy with stillness. Okay, that sounds good. This gives me the experience, I said the awakened experience of yourself, but it also gets your body doing more alignment, more attunement, more of what it already naturally knows how to do. Okay, well, okay, well, that sounds good. So how do you do that? Access, strength, and integrate. How do you do that? He gave the rest of the formula. So basically, even though it's a formula, it's not a formula. Meaning, it's not a package. Like, if you have this condition, you do this. If you have that condition, you do that. We don't do that. This allows you, well, only for yourself, for your own vitality, but anyone you're helping or supporting or working with as a teacher or as a yoga therapist, to take the skills that you have, the techniques and technology of your own yoga tradition, and go, ah, I can just pluck this right out and I know how to use it. So you access through breath. What awakens your vital force, I mean, it's kind of obvious, right, to yogis, is your breath. But what we're accessing is your vitality, that hidden capacity, hidden resource within yourself. So you access through breath. You strengthen through movement. And so there are yogic traditions that have natural movement in it. Kulini yoga is one. Vinyasa is another, but you can 
take what you know from whatever your tradition is and create a rhythm to it, can't you? You bring rhythmic movement and that strengthens the vitality or the capacity. It's another way of anchoring it in and to go to your question. And then you integrate it through sound or mantra. In, in our case, you inhale, sat, exhale, nam, or you have any other kinds of mantras that you use. But your breath, um, the prana is carried and the sound current are carried together. The, the nod or the rhythmic sound is carried on the prana. And so as you move your prana through with the sound current, you have whatever impact that that mantra gives you moving through your body. In other words, your sound, the effect of the sound becomes literally embodied through this process. And you can do this, simple, I mean, simple things like, especially, do you have anybody that you know who really would benefit from what you have to offer, but they don't want to do yoga? Mm -hmm. You hear people like that? They can walk and do this. So you can walk and set a rhythmical breath. You can walk and use a sound current or a mantra. It's a, called Chattanjap. It's an ancient, ancient system in yogic tradition. But you, again, bringing us to modern medicine. So this brings us to Shunya, which is uh, a Gurmukhi word, which means your, it's your still point. And in that still point is where your healing energy comes. It's when that's, it's in that state of equipoise that your entire capacity, because you've identified, you've connected, you remembered who you are and what your resources are. And that's where your body comes to bear. It says, oh, I got this. I know how to do this. I just needed a certain environment for this to happen. Yoga practice gives you that environment. So when we have this question about what do I do? Access through breath, strengthen through movement, integrate through sound. It creates that still point or the shunya. And that's the place, say, you know, when you talk about going into shavasana, that state of deep relaxation becomes a conscious exercise in itself. And it's brought, you brought into it through your practice. Make sense? Next step. Any questions or comments about what we covered in the just in the last two minutes? We're going to have now a, an actual practice, an experience of bringing uh, breath, rhythm, and sound. The rhythm in terms of movement and sound into a, a pole. In the practice of Kulini Yoga, we have what we call kriyas, kriyas being a completed action. So it's like a recipe. So you have, for example, a specific combination of movement, a posture, an eye focus, a drishti, a breath, a mantra. And it's that particular combination that gives you a specific outcome. So for example, you are familiar with Kirtan Kriya that's been researched by Dr. Dharma Singh on memory loss and rec recovering memory loss. We'll, we'll be a little bit of time. His research has been widely published, so many people, especially in um, yoga world, are learning more about it. But, so for those who don't know, it's OK, because my metaphor is not going to work with you anyway. Uh, with there's a particular sound current that's used in that meditation, which we will be using. There's a rhythmical movement of the fingers. And in yogic tradition, the fingers represent the tattvas and also the nervous system. So there's a movement with um, finger to index to thumb, middle to thumb, ring to thumb, little finger to thumb. It goes with has a rhythm, it has a sound, it has a breath to it. And this particular meditation we're going to use that incorporates those basic your vitality principle in it is uh, was, was the meditation I used when I did my doctoral dissertation. So here we are. Just for those of you who are too young to remember, you know, your tender age, you don't remember 1986, 1995, mm -hmm. that period of time when there was so much fear around people who were HIV positive. People really weren't trusting the science about how it was transmitted and that kind of thing. And so 
we, and there was also very little medical treatment. The medical treatment that's now being used didn't go into clinical trials until I think 1990. So we had like four or five years of this. And they were still working on the dose a bit. Who saw Byers, Dyer's Vallis Byers Club? That was based on a man named Ron Woodruff, who was in Dallas, but he would come to Los Angeles and speak at HIV groups of, a lot around basically finding self-care, what nutrients to take, what herbs to take, what other kinds of practices will help you build your immune system. And at that time, we developed a program it was the 80s, remember. Jane Fonda's workout studio was on Robertson Boulevard. You could see it from our yoga center. Uh, everyone was into fitness, and so we called our program Immune Fitness because it was you know, upbeat and positive and like that. OK, so in that um, process of working with people with rhythm and sound, and not having any medical treatment around it, there was this big question at the time. There was a gentleman, Robert Ramian, in Columbia University on the East Coast, and in UCLA, uh, George Solomon and Lydia Temeshock, who studied what are the th qualities of people who are HIV positive who don't get, who don't progress to AIDS? And those who do, what are the qualities of those people who don't die in 18 months to two years, which was the prognosis at that time, if someone had an AIDS diagnostic condition. They, it was not any kind of treatment. It wasn't, they could be on herbs and acupuncture, they could be on AZT. What made the difference, and to a yogi, you're not so surprised about this, was the quality of their thought. It was the capacity of their frequency of their beliefs. So, for example, if you had the belief that I could have some agency in my life. If I, what I do makes a difference. If I have that belief, they found that people did not progress. They were called long-term non-progressors. In Stanford, Albert Bandura was doing research on self, this is called self-efficacy, the belief that what you do makes a difference. And he found that not even doing anything to make a difference, just thinking that, oh, I have some agency in my life, improved your immune system. So I got curious about this. There's a few other components to it that can make it very interesting. But I got curious about this one specific belief, the belief that what you do makes a difference. And so I took a meditation that Yogi Bhajan gave for building self-efficacy. And we, at this time, most, this was 30 years ago, the research was longitudinal, long-term, meaning three, five, seven years. And they saw, oh, this meditation does this. Someone with a life-threatening illness is not going to do anything that's going to take that long. A, they may not be around, and B, I got other things to do. You know, if my life expectancy is suddenly that shortened, I'm going to be really conscious of how I'm going to use my time. So if this didn't work the first time, who's coming back? And really, why would you? So we studied our, what made our, our contribution unique in that we said one time, one time, one time not a repeated length of time, three, five years. One time, if you do this meditation once, will it improve your self-efficacy? Well, I wouldn't be telling you the story if I had, you know, yes, of course it did. <laughs> yes, it did. Otherwise, I would not be sharing this. I could still finish my dissertation with a no, but this was a yes. And so this is the meditation we're gonna do. Okay, so in Kulini Yoga practice, we start with a mantra, Om Namo Gurudev Namo. And it's an attuning process. Om Namo is I, you all know Om. Om, O-N-G. So Om is the infinite, experiencing the vastness. Om, O-N-G, it's experiencing the infinite within your finite self. The vastness within you. So Om Namo, Namo, you know, same root as Namaste and Nam. Meaning, I recognize, I greet, Om Namo, I acknowledge my infinity within my finite self. Guru Dev, Guru is that which brings you from darkness to light. Dev is the unseen energy, the unseen teachers, Guru Dev. And Namo is I recognize, I bow to. So we start this in prayer pose. 
If you're up for it, please do it together. You can observe if you don't want to just check it out. So for those of you who've already done this, if you've taken Kalini Yoga classes before, you can belt it out, help everybody else. And for those of who are hearing it for the first time, if you want to like listen for a bit first, and then this, we do it three cycles, a second, third cycle, you want to chime in, please do that. It's we're normally done in one breath. We're going to do it with a little pause in between, so if you want to catch a, a half a breath in the second round, you can do that. The sound ong is made like you're blowing a conch mm -hmm. with the idea that your head, your cranium, with all its open spaces, you create sound through that air. And you, so it's not so much making a sound as it resonating, vibrating the sound. And when you do it, you might notice a shift in your feeling in your chest in the throat, in the face and navel cavity, in your lips and nose, start a little frequency vibrating. So we will go Om Namo, take a half breath, a little pause, Gurudev Namo. The posture is a prayer pose, your mudra. So your thumbs are about 60 degrees away from the rest of the hand. You place the knuckles on your sternum, right where they fit. Eyes closed. If you want to take a peek at the words, you can keep them open. We'll start with an exhalation. Bring your breath in. Oh. its own new rhythm and just allow yourself to feel the experience of the sound current and relax your hands the meditation practice we're going to do is called Pauri Kriya and you use the tattvas of the fingers through this. So your fingers will be moving index to thumb, middle to thumb, and make like a circle. So the tips of the finger and the thumb touch. So it's not like the pads, it's the tips. So it's a little circle you make like that. So you'll be moving the fingers in a sequence. Index, middle, uh, ring, pinky, like that. And so this is the brief description of what each of those mudras uh, activates. So you get the whole thing, you get the whole picture with these. We're going to use a sound current in the frequency of this. So when you make the index to the thumb, you say sa. And the sa, just drop your jaw down and let the air come out from the navel, sa. Then the next finger, ta, na, ma. And exaggerate your lips a little bit. Make that na, na, ma sound because you're working the meridians in your lips and tongue and, and face. So the sound also activates the meridians in your face. So it'll be like this. Sa, ta, na, ma. Sa, ta, na, ma. Okay, you got it. Now. This is done with a breath. It's not like here in Kriya. It's a little different, for those of you who are familiar with that one. With this meditation, the fingers and the movement are the same. 
But what's different is you'll be inhaling in eight parts It takes a couple of cycles to get your each part equal, so relax into that. Each time you sniff has a sound to it, so you're going mentally thinking, sa, ta, na, ma, sa, ta, na, ma. Now your exhalation is where you make the sound out loud. So you got your eight in, then you say out loud, sa, ta, na, ma, sa, ta, na, Ma. The mantra is a monotone. When Kirtan creates more melody to it, this one is a monotone. Your eyes will be closed. There's no specified eye focus with this. So your breath is moderated by the movement of the fingers and the mantra. Your sound is this, both silently and out loud. Your eye focus is relaxed. Ready? Questions? Okay, so we'll start with an exhalation. Give yourself some, um, allow your posture so that your spine can be aligned and make sure your necks in Jalundarban, you have a nice even neck. And both feet are on the floor if you're sitting so the weight's equal, so your hips are stable. Okay, together exhale. We'll inhale in eight parts. Sa ta na ma sa ta na ma sa sa ta na ma sa ta na ma sa ta na ma sa
Bring your breath in in one long deep breath. Retain your breath gently. Allow the sound current to just absorb and resonate through you. Relax your breath. You may want to keep your eyes closed for a little bit, or you can open them as you choose. Just allow the sensations to integrate with you. Your breath finds its own new rhythm. And when that feels complete to you, you can open your eyes, you can bring your breath in, you can bring your arms up, open and close your fingers, shake out your hands. Let your breath relax, arms down. How do you feel? You might find this helpful to practice before you begin a, a change in your life, a new habit, stopping something, starting something, because it builds your capacity to adhere to whatever the decision you've made, to adhere to whatever intention you've set. It's very useful for that. We did it just for three minutes. In Kalini Yoga tradition, we, our meditation periods our, our movement periods tend to be divided into 3, 7, 11, 31, 62 segments because at each point different things happen. Three minutes when your body's at rest it takes for the circulation to go through once. So as you created the biochemical shifts through the meditation practice it has a chance then to release into your bloodstream. So we practice for three and we had a pause for 30 seconds just for you to get that integration. Any questions or comments you have? Yes? Uh, you said a word a moment ago that I missed. Um, three minutes is the time it takes for the circulation to go through. When your body's at rest, yeah. Your circulatory system goes through once, yes. What is the shift at seven and 11 minutes? Uh, seven minutes, you start to shift your mental frequency. Eleven minutes, you start to shift your magnetic field. Uh, the next bigger leap, you could you could leap it to nothing, eighteen or twenty-two, but the bigger next bigger leap would be thirty-one minutes. And at that point, it's the last three minutes of that thirty-one, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty to that last three minutes, where the, the the shifts that happen in your brain, you know, in terms of the hippocampus and that main third ventricle area, begin, or, or in yogic language, when the omelet starts, the nectar starts. Other comments or questions? So I'm grateful for our time together tonight. It's always an honor and privilege to, to support people who are growing in their consciousness for service to others, and I feel very blessed.